I'm pianist Garrick Olson. In 1970, I won the International Chopin Competition in Warsaw and later recorded all of Chopin's works. In this video, I'm going to break down Chopin's innovations at the keyboard. In the case that Chopin didn't invent some of the things I'm talking about, he certainly championed them in a most public way. Number one, playing the thumb on black keys. An important feature of Chopin's use of the keyboard was his unrestricted use of the thumb on black keys. In the time of Bach, many people played the harpsichord with four fingers on each hand. The thumb was not involved, it was considered too clumsy. With Chopin, you get to a point where you have simply no choice. Number two, striking two keys with the thumb. This was an innovation that uh, Chopin took advantage of to increase the range of size of the piano, because if you could actually smash down two keys in a strong passage with the thumb, you actually had more fingers free to play more notes of a bigger chord. Number three, finger sliding. Sliding the fingers from one note to the next rather than attacking them separately with different fingers is a feature that Chopin used a great deal, especially, of course, from black notes to white notes where it's easier to slide down. This video is brought to you by the Chopin Foundation of the United States, which for 50 years has been dedicated to developing the careers of young American pianists and spreading the music of Chopin to everyone around the world, not just musicians. And in that spirit, this fall, I'll be teaming up with the Chopin Foundation to produce the Chopin Podcast, a 12-part deep dive into the music and recorded legacy of Chopin, starring Garrick Olson and featuring a stellar lineup of guests from the classical piano world. The series will be available on podcast platforms with video versions published right here on this channel. So now is a good time to like and subscribe and ring that bell and make sure you get notified every time a new episode drops. To learn more about the Chopin podcast, just follow that pop-up right there, or you can find the link in the description. And this is all in anticipation of the National Chopin Competition in Miami this January, put on by the Chopin Foundation every five years. If you can't make it to the competition in person, good news. Every round will be live streamed right here on YouTube and hosted by yours truly. Just make sure to subscribe to the Chopin Foundation YouTube channel where those rounds will be aired. And I look forward to seeing you in the live chat. And if you're an American pianist interested in entering the National Chopin Competition, the application deadline is October 1st. So there's still time to get your materials together and apply. 
top prize winners get an automatic ticket to Warsaw later in the year to participate in one of the biggest classical music events in the world, the International Chopin Competition. And chilling on the juries of both competitions will be Garrick Olson, who, you may have noticed, knows a thing or two about Chopin. Number four, passing longer fingers over short fingers. Another characteristic that Chopin developed more than previously was passing longer fingers over shorter fingers. Passing long fingers over short is critical in the opus 10, number two etude, which was something completely new in the technique of the piano at the time. In other words, the upper fingers have to keep a legato by crossing over in a rather somewhat uncomfortable way, both going up and down, or down sometimes under uh, the keyboard. But, you know, you, you could do that without uh, using third, fourth, and fifth fingers. You could use all of them, but he makes sure you don't by plucking an accompaniment in the first two fingers. So you've got the equivalent of two instruments playing. There's a dazzling example of this in the first impromptu, going down the keyboard from high up, where you use all five fingers in a row, but then you turn your wrist inward and cross the fifth over the thumb this way. He just goes in positions and the hand just has to follow along. Chopin did this very much on purpose, not just for finger gymnastics and development, but to secure a smoother and better legato, no matter what. In 1830, when he invented a lot of this, nobody else had quite figured out the physiology of the hand so well. We were taught to play with our hands in a very neat position and just pass the thumb under as necessary and you didn't do any twisting. Good manners was keeping your hands still rather than flexible. And uh, Chopin understood that that flew in the face of nature and would prohibit um, development of both the hand and keyboard facility and sound possibilities. Number five, flatter fingers to obtain a singing touch. I studied with the great teacher Rosina Levin, who studied at the Moscow Conservatory in the 19th century, I believe, or early 20th. In any case, and one of her uh, things she would say about a gentle singing melody, especially in Chopin, was that especially on the first note of a piece, you invite people in, but you also invite the piano. So rather than playing the note or hitting the piano, you, or playing into the piano, you, she would say, come to me. so you don't get an inadvertent, uh, over-energetic accent. Number six, finger substitution. This was a Chopin specialty. Uh, many people noted that he would change his fingers on a given key as often as organists do. Now organists, that's the only way they can make a legato. In order to actually connect tones, they actually have to sometimes substitute fingers to get where they're going. And Chopin did this a great deal. And it's a very good technique to learn because it tends to make you feel less stuck where you are. Sometimes if you're playing a passage and you have to get down there, you feel a little stuck, but if you can calmly switch your finger on the key without depressing it again and learn it as a, as a technique or a trick or a, uh, a way of doing things, it gives you uh, more fingers to work with somehow in a magical way. Number seven, Phantom Melody. Mm -hmm. 
Chopin was, of course, a master of melodies, one of the greatest melodists in the history of music. And he just had melodies like a wonderful fruit tree just grows gorgeous fruit in season. And he had so many that sometimes they sort of crop up in places you don't expect as secondary voices or as almost imaginary textures in the middle. You sort of think, oh, there's a secondary line developing. Oh, yeah, it's there and now it's not. So that's maybe why we call them sometimes phantom melodies. Number eight, three hand effect. Every so often you get the suggestion that, oh, there's a third hand playing. Somebody else has come in and added a tune. And Chopin does this in the Etude Opus 25, number five, where the melody sings in the middle with decorations above and a, and a firm bass line below, but the tenor sings independently, the actual tune that you hear. When we have the phenomenon of the third hand melody, it's always in the middle of the keyboard and it's achieved by the left hand playing some, its usual bass and the right hand playing in this case a decorative treble, but the actual melody is shared between usually the thumbs of the pianist um, and is legatoized by the, use, the skillful use of the pedal. The great pianist Talberg was more or less the specialist of this and he just he took this ball and ran with it but it's possible and the Chopin biographer Alan Walker suggests that perhaps maybe Chopin might have preceded Talberg in this effect of course Talberg made it one of his calling cards and one of his greatest specialties and yet the great Franz Liszt took that from Talberg and, and Chopin and even outdid Talberg number nine rhythmic innovations Chopin was a rhythmically innovative composer, sometimes extremely so. Of course, he was extraordinarily innovative in the domain of harmony, another very important element of music. But that's too big a subject to address in this series. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit about rhythm at this point. And these are very pianistic things that can probably only happen in a pianistic context naturally. In the first Nocturne, Opus 9, number 1, he has 11 against 6. These are not to be counted out as rhythmic exercises. These are free rubatos in which the steady state of the left hand remains undisturbed and the right hand is completely free, not put into a prison by the regularity of the left. Well, that's a lot of words about that. It's a magical effect. In the fourth ballad, he achieves one of the greatest degrees of rhythmic complexity in all of European music. Certainly before Brahms, and Brahms doesn't outdo it. Two bars of 6-8 music, which Chopin has progressively divided into smaller and smaller units, and takes advantage of every, what we call, subdivision to make Several rhythms happen at once. A large two to the bar, a large six, a small six, a big four, and most revolutionarily, three, three, four bars that swim over two bars of six, eight without any rubato at all. And it sounds like the most free music you can possibly imagine. Number 10, sitting lower on the piano bench. Chopin favored for his students a lower seat. I'm, I'm going to quote inaccurately, but the biography of Chopin, Alan Walker, points out that Chopin wrote in letters that he did not favor a high seat, favored by many uh, virtuosos who liked to strike the piano from a, from a high angle. He felt that that often contributed to a harsh sound. So I would say that uh, Chopin liked very much, as do I, a relatively low seat with your, with your hands quite flexible, in touch with the keys a lot, and um, not, not, you know, flying about in the air. He would call it catching pigeons, and he didn't care for that very much either. 
As an illustration of sitting low, uh, let's, let's imagine a mazurka that Chopin might play sitting rather comfortably on a, on a lower piano bench. Number 11, flutter pedal. It's reported that Chopin used what you might call a flutter pedal. In other words, not just down or just up, but and, and not just even in the middle, but actually a, a, a sort of vibrato on the pedal, to both to sustain and clarify things so that textures didn't get overloaded, but they still retained some kind of glow or warmth it was described, and yet clarity. Number 12, catching a dissonance in the pedal. Chopin sometimes, infrequently, liked to catch a dissonance in the pedal that didn't really belong to the harmony that was going on. Uh, it was a color effect. Chopin is one of the first composers, perhaps the first, who deliberately used colors of sound as structural elements. But without getting too complicated, let's look at the prelude in F major, where in a completely F major surrounding, he catches in the pedal the E flat, the dominant seventh note of F major, and sustains it and ends a piece with it, which is really remarkable for the 19th century because it was at least 100 years later that people began to do this with any frequency at all. Number 13. Avoiding C major. Chopin wrote very few pieces in C major. Sometimes it's unavoidable, like in the 24 Preludes, where he has all the major and minor keys. The first etude is in C major. It was very common to teach kids, it still is very common to teach kids, starting on C major, starting with middle C. One, two, three, four, five. Rather than recommending the C major scale, Chopin preferred the B major scale, which starts with B, these two fingers on black keys, which are extended, then the thumb. So you get that very relaxed position where the hand is on and of the keyboard. Of course, it's not possible to write all the music you want to write with just for the comfort of the hand in mind, but nevertheless, he kept it in mind. Uh, and in the fourth scherzo, there's a very brilliant passage, which, yes, is very difficult but fits the hand and the keyboard perfectly, and I'll show it to you in slow motion. So it's not that I advocate or he advocated playing absolutely with flat fingers, but this way you don't have to torture yourself. Number 14, against finger equalization. By equalize, we have to understand that what we call the fourth finger on the piano uh, is tied by tendons to the third and partially by the fifth. It will never be as strong or able to lift as high. You know, I can do that, and I can do that, and I can do that. It, it just won't have that freedom. But people thought that with training, you could do that. And there were even many machines that were invented to help equalize the uh, strength of the, of the fingers of the hand. And most notably, the great composer Robert Schumann 
had one of those machines with pulleys hanging from the ceiling to hold this up so you had to work hard, and he disabled both of his hands. Chopin even called the third and fourth fingers, thinking especially of the fourth, the Siamese twins, and he made no effort to uh, unconjoin the conjoined twins. He just accepted it and used it. And of course, his way has won out because it's the only way you can possibly do it. By the time, you know, by the time you get to Brahms and Rachmaninoff, uh, everybody understood that. He showed the way. The first etude of Chopin, which is like a regular arpeggio, except it's over a scale of a tenth, and you have to actually, it's, he described it almost as using a bow over strings. He didn't want to hear, he wanted, which just doing that, which seems quite simple, but if you do it this way, you can't play, you can't play the piano. You actually have to use all of the joints of the wrist in all of their directions. You have to have a good bridge in your hand and still flexibility. You have to expand and contract all at once and you have to have a free arm. So it's, it's, it's more or less like this. It's not rectilinear. As a matter of fact, many people say to me, because I have very large hands, that, well, of course, I can't play the first etude because my hands isn't big enough. But I've known pianists who have quite small hands who play it brilliantly because they understand what Chopin has shown us. Another torturous example is the Etude Opus 10, number 2, with the longer fingers crossing over the shorter ones rather than fighting their way. Those first two studies of Etudes of Chopin are really quite a dictionary as to how to play the piano in the most natural way. Now, they're terribly, terribly, terribly difficult and require a great deal of skill. But once you have it and can do them, you don't feel like you're going to pull or strain anything. It's, it's organic and it, it fits the human hand really quite well. Number 15, the liberated thumb. Another innovation that Chopin did, which is related to the crossing over and under, is the fact that he liberated the thumb as a special hanging joint that works differently. So sometimes he would occupy the upper fingers with something else, and the thumb would be kind of busy doing something else as in the Etude Opus 10, number two, where the upper fingers are playing a legato line and the bottom two are, meaning the liberated thumb, is, is plucking a different instrument. Independently, I like to say to piano students, it's a bit like learning to eat with chopsticks. One has to be firm and the other one has to be flexible. He also does this with a trill in the right hand and the upper fingers in the bark roll and then you have to play a little melody, which is, that's quite difficult. <laughs> it's all quite difficult, uh, uh, as giving you an extra voice in the same hand. In the Etude Opus 10, number three, he has the accompaniment in the lower two fingers of the right hand and the melody in the upper three fingers. So he's, he's, he's taking off on all these ideas and combining them in magical ways. Number 16, coloratura. Coloratura comes from color. Uh, it often means a florid, colorful way of singing, if you will. Uh, it's also called in Italian fioritura, uh, which is from flowers, uh, but very, very flowery, elaborate, uh, almost baroque, curly cues and lines in a melody. The quintessential Chopin moment for coloratura or fioritura comes before the return of the main theme of the Barcarolle in the section called Dolce Sfogato, which everybody swoons at because it's so beautiful. And it, show, it has a coloratura line, by the way, which sings from there to there, which is farther than a singer can do. But it sounds like a singer having a, 
a great leap of coloratura, and it's one of the most ravishing things in all the world of music. I hope you've enjoyed this survey of Chopin's most influential contributions to the art of keyboard playing. But it's really just the tip of the iceberg of musical inventiveness that Chopin exhibited in his music. And you can watch Garrick Olson break down even more of these innovations exclusively on my Patreon. Just click that pop-up or find the link in the description to become a member and support all of this content that I make. And now I'll let Garrick leave you with one more coloratura moment perhaps the most signature moment in all of Chopin's music. I'd like to leave you with this as a little icing on the cake. The passage out of the Nocturne, Opus 27, number 2, in which the coloratura actually goes nuts. It's as fast and as virtuosic, and only Chopin could do that, certainly at that time, and for probably for years afterwards. And it probably is until some jazz pianists at, in the 20th century that you begin to get such hummingbird fingers. <laughs> <laughs>